Hey, it's the Profit Answer Man, Rocky Lalvani. If you're new to the podcast, check out my interview with Mike Michalowicz. It's episode number two. If you want to hear about each chapter in the Profit First book, go back and listen to episodes three through 13. Episode one is the why and how. On the Profit Answer Man, we learn money mastery without all the complicated accounting mumbo jumbo using a simple system. Your accountant is busy documenting your transactions and creating a rear view mirror of what happened. My guess is you don't even look at the reports they sent you. If you're like most business owners, you struggle with this, and it's not your fault. We aren't taught money in school. And accountants aren't taught how to be profitable. The Profit First system created by Mike Michalowicz works, and he certified me to help you implement the system in your business. Remember, the new equation is sales minus profit equals expenses. Let's face it, without cash flow, you can't pay your employees, buy needed materials, or pay your mortgage and support your family. I help you to do that and more so you can focus on the parts of the business you love and receive the rewards for your labor and investment into your business. The stronger you are as a business owner, the more jobs you create, the better we are as a country. Small business owners are the backbone of America, and for that, you deserve to be well rewarded. Just remember, more revenue does not equal more profit. That's why we focus on the bottom line. I love systems. And systems lead to profits. It's amazing what you can systematize in your business. When you're not needed in your business, the value of your business goes up. So stop being the bottleneck and let others do the work. Remember, businesses are systems and people run the systems for you. That's our topic for today. Peter is CEO and co-founder of Macanta Software Limited, a small business system and automation expert. He's a two-time Amazon best-selling author with Barefoot Business, three key systems to attract more leads, win more sales, and delight more customers without your business killing you. And he's also the co-author and organizer responsible for bringing together extra expert contributors on three continents to produce another Amazon number one international bestseller, Franchising Freedom. Let's meet Peter. Welcome to the Profit Answer Man, Peter de Villiers. It's great to have you join us today. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Can you share a little bit about yourself and your business? Yeah, so um, I'm based in the UK. I'm about 45 minutes outside of London. And I'm co-founder and CEO of Macanta, which is a no-code platform that allows businesses to create a custom CRM and business process automation um, system without needing to write any code or taking on the risk or cost of um, custom software development. And so let's just take a step to clarify that. By CRM, you mean Customer Relationship Manager? Yes. And there are tons of them out there. I used to have a favorite one, and then the iPhone came along, and they did not update. And then they, I don't know what happened to them. And since then, I've never been able to find a good CRM that I loved that worked well, desktop and mobile. And yeah, unfortunately... I know. It's a shame that, you know, you had a product back in the 90s that worked so well that yeah. today I can't find it. So maybe I'll have to customize one with you. Yeah, yeah. Just just create your own. I just need a very simple one. And I'm like, I just want my my phone. And now the phone's less of an issue with um, going to Zoom. But I wanted my calendar and my CRM on the same system. Yeah. So that it ran my calendar, it created everything, and I could immediately, in the old days, I I would open up my calendar and I would click on the person in the calendar. It would dial their phone and say, hey, yeah. you're having a yeah. call with them. Just simple things so that you keep track of everything. I've built new systems around it instead, but I still miss it. 
<laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's quite funny that some things you think has made so much progress and then other things it just sort of it's almost gone like like you you talk about the idea just tap to dial and things like that has has almost gone by the wayside people sometimes forget that someone's still making phone calls <laughs> We're still talking to each other. E- email and, and all of that stuff is great, but at some point you have to talk to someone. Correct. But, yeah, well, business is done on, like, at the end of the day, business is done person to person. Yeah. And even, I mean, even client calls. I still got to get on the, well, phone or Zoom or whatever and, and yeah. have those types of conversations. Yeah, well, we'll dig into that further. I know you are a big fan of Mike Michalowicz. We haven't spent much time talking about some of his other books. And I know that you're a big fan of two of his books. Let's start with Pumpkin Plan. Mm. So how has that helped you guys? Well, it's, and I, I think I've probably, I've, I've not read it. I've only had it on Audible. And I, I must have listened to it at least five times. Um, on the one hand, he's a very entertaining guy, so it's fun. it's it's easy to listen to. Um, but it's very much just been a case. So I've I've had a, a varied business journey um, over the last twenty years. Um, but specifically for the business that we're in now, it has just been almost like a like a repeating cycle of getting more and more focused, both on what the business actually does. And for us at the moment, we've we've we're very focused on our product offering now, but it's it's going through almost like a pumpkin plan process on who do we serve, because lots of businesses are in a position where well, we can serve loads of different people, and therefore you if you can't focus on anyone, then you end up letting most people down because you're not quite right. Everything's just balancing almost there, but not quite. So I just I just use the the premise of it. Um, and go back to it because you, when I listened to it five years ago, my business, where we were, what we were trying to do was completely different from today. So listening to it again, you get very different insights. Um, so it really, for me, it has been a book that I can probably once a year go to, and it has an impact every time, even though I know exactly what the book is about, just having it through a lens of a different time and experience. It has just, just had a real impact every time I listen. You know, I always bring this back to sports. And for sports, the way I look at this is simply every season, they go back to spring training, right? Mm. Or fall, whatever the beginning of the season is, you go back to basic training. Yeah. And yet in business, how often do we go back to the basics and say, hey, Let's re-examine our business. Let's start from scratch and reevaluate. Are we doing the basics we're supposed to be doing or did we yeah. forget? And then how do we, in, in the case of Pumpkin Plan, how do we get more and more niched? Because the more and more niched you are, the higher and higher a price you command. Yeah, because which, you're, you're higher value to that particular audience. Correct. So you become more profitable just by yeah. doing that. And at yeah. the end of the day, that is the, the bottom line. The more niched you are, the bigger you can create that that space, you get rid of all the competition too. Also eliminates an awful lot of complexity in the business. Because if you're trying to serve 10 audiences, you, you've got to have 10 ways of serving them. Because to really satisfy them, you can't just serve everyone the same. And and that that adds unnecessary complexity to just the delivery of of your service or product. Whereas if you can really hone it in, um, it really just simplifies your day to day. But it also simplifies the conversations that you have with prospects because it's familiar, and you can really dig into the detail of their business because you know their business and industry. And that's the key, knowing their business and industry. And sometimes I hear that from my clients. There, We talk about why they lost a particular deal. And it's a lot of times it's we felt the other vendor understood us better. Mm. Right. That they understood our business. They talked our language. And at the end of the day, that's what it comes down to. Yeah. 
So kind of shifting gears, because we're going to talk more about automations and systems is Mike's other book, Clockwork, which is all Mm -hmm. about getting yourself out of the business and systematizing the business. And, And we've talked about this before. If you're looking for an exit, a systematized business is worth much, much more than a business where all the knowledge is in your head. How did Clockwork help you? Um, it it actually for us and for talking to customers, it gave me a few ways of having conversations that was far more articulate to have the ideas that were in my head. <laughs> and it's like, oh, yes, that's what I mean. And being able to describe that. But it also then obviously... Um, take a lot from it and and put that into our own business and it and it really is just it, it, it's quite interesting i think pretty much all of mike's books at the ground it's just about focus and with clockwork again it's a case of well actually if i can focus on the thing that i'm really good at and not globally the thing i'm really good at but the bit in my business that i have to do that's my highest value then the business is better, the customers are better off, everything's better. And clockwork is just a really good process of identifying the time and the effort um, and resources that's spent on the things that actually is not my, my unique ability and therefore automate, eliminate or delegate it, just give it to someone else or try and get rid of it all together so that each person in the team can actually focus on what they're really good at. Um, and for, for us, for instance, um, when it comes to our developers, we don't get our developers to sort of work on everything. Um, we've got Jiva, for instance, who's backend and API. That's all he does. He doesn't go near the front end because, yes, he can do it, but it's not, it's not his deep knowledge. So he's learning as he's doing it. We'd rather hand it over to Jethro, who that's what he does. He never goes back end. He's just at the front end, but he's not learning while he's doing it because it's his deep level of skill. And it's sort of having a process to identify those things, I think clockwork's really good for. It's then still down to you to actually implement it and, and being brave enough to do those things but um, actually just having that process to identify those different things, I think Clockwork's really good for. Did Mike talk about his handyman? Was that in Clockwork or was that in Profit? Uh, no, the, the handyman who then also does the gutters. Yeah, and the, yeah that's, in, that's in Pumpkin Plan. That's in Pumpkin Plan. <laughs> yeah, okay. that's in Pumpkin Plan. I, I remember that story because I remember – you know, we've done real estate, so we've got a whole rehab going on. And I made the mistake of of letting people who do roofing and gutters get near the windows and yeah. letting the painter get near something else. And I've learned, bring the expert in for that mm. particular thing. And even though the other guy's there and says he can do it, they end up costing you a lot more money and trouble. And so yeah. you really need to to do that, put the right people in the right place, let them do what they love, and life gets to be fun. Yeah, yeah. So we're here a little bit to talk about your book. It's called Barefoot Business. What's the book all about? <laughs> um, well, I'll come – well, the, the title is simply just from the fact that I – my preference is not to wear shoes. Um, so I grew up in South Africa, um, where the weather is a lot better than here in the UK. And I would, when I fit, when I leave school, when I finished the school day, I'd carry my shoes home. I, I'd sooner carry a pair of shoes than wear them. Um, and it's still the same now. I, I'd go into town and whatever with no shoes. So that's where the title comes from. Um, but, and, and I, I'd like to build a business that allows me to not wear shoes as much as possible. <laughs> um, but the book itself, um, actually the inspiration for it. So I've, I've, I've been dealing with business or process automation and systems and things for, for a number of years. But the inspiration for the book actually came from, I was fortunate enough to be with, in a mastermind for one day with Michael Gerber. Um, from the e-myth 
Um, and we were talking about what we're doing and everything. And he, he just, he was able to crystallize what we, what we were actually doing as opposed to what we thought we were doing. Um, and, and he had a knack for that. Um, and, and it just came out that it's, it's these three key systems. Now, every business, once you go layers deeper, there is more complexity and there's details. But any system or process and any aspect of your business actually fits into three key systems, which is client fulfillment, client acquisition, and lead generation. Um, and some some areas would match over those but being able to look at your business and say well this activity that i'm doing out of those three systems those key areas where does it sit and therefore what's its priority and how do we want that experience to be how do we want to manage it and really just then having it those dividing lines of saying well okay this is where the lead generation system stops and it becomes client acquisition and being really clear about what client acquisition then is and at what point is a client fulfillment and making sure that those are, are there and then making sure that everything's in place to deal with it. Um, and and um, he talks about it a, a lot and he did on the day as well. It's very much the case that you want to start at the end at the client fulfillment system because lots of businesses, and this happens with a client acquisition as well, where lots of businesses would have, oh, we don't have enough leads. We don't have enough leads. And it's actually, the problem isn't not enough leads. It's, does everyone know what happens to those leads? Are the right things happening to the leads? Are the right things being done for those leads to actually turn them into customers? And when they are customers, do they then feel like customers or do they miss being a prospect because they were treated so well when they were a prospect, but now that they're a customer, they're almost forgotten about and, and having that structure around the business. That's interesting. And I've never heard it explained that way when you look at a business and we do a lot of, we do the math behind the business. And when mm. we look at the math behind the business, it's very much like that. What does it cost you to generate your leads and bring in the business? So that's all the marketing and, and all the metrics and the close rates and everything else. And then we look at how much does it actually cost to fulfill the client? And then we mm. look at overhead. So we're kind of missing that one piece. I guess the difference between the leads and the acquisition step is is a little bit more defined with you. And it's shifting gears, I guess, at that point. Yeah, and, and it's then roles and responsibilities because um, for, for my mind, the lead generation ends the moment someone raises their hand and says, I'm interested in what you're doing and what you have to offer. So the moment you can identify me, the moment you've got my name and email address, now I'm in the client acquisition system because the lead generation's finished. And, and thinking of it that way, it just delineates that actually, well, the client acquisition system in the business, is it busy and full and operational and efficient and, and producing the results we want, or is it not? Because what, what happens also is we look at, well, how many leads are we generating? How many sales are we making? And we're saying, well, we need more leads. It's like, well, actually, no, it's it, that bit in the middle there's a lot of leverage there because lots of people just pour more water into a leaky bucket and then wonder why they don't have a full bucket at the end of the day. And that's why we look at the conversion rate. What's your percentage of leads to sales? And mm. it, depending on what that number is, we will have a conversation of how can we improve it? Because if mm. it's only five or 10%, then it, it, you're right. It's not more leads. It's, hey, how do we go from 10 to 20% yeah. and improve our thing? That means that maybe we are not even following up, which happens more often than you'd imagine. And, and it's also, if, if you're, if you, like you say, you, you work with the, the sort of the money of those areas, it's then to say, well, actually, no, we don't need to increase our lead generation budget. We need to allocate more of our budget to that client acquisition phase of, well, we now know who's interested. 
what can we do to get more of them to actually become customers? And that, and that may be follow-ups, direct mail, whether it's um, more people who can actually answer questions, more people on the phones, wh- whatever it may be. But it, it's not always a case of, oh, we need to spend more on marketing. Correct. That's why we, but we love automated systems on mm. that side as well. One of my favorites is uh, they ask, we answer. It's mm. just creating all the videos to answer all your clients' questions yeah. so that by the time they get to you, they just say, hey, how much and when can you deliver it? Yeah, yeah. And and that is a phenomenal automated system. So I love this one quote that came out. It's the system runs the business, the staff run the system. Yeah. Can you kind of explain that a little bit more? Um, so... If you think about a business as a mechanical device, and and you you have to imagine this here, but let's say, for instance, it was um, a rail car, for instance. Now, the... You, you've seen them in the comedy films and with the, with the levers that people are pulling up and down to make this rail car go down the track. Now, they're not concerned with the wheels. They don't need to be concerned with the wheels. They don't need to be concerned with the track. That's all in place. All they need to do is to keep the thing in motion, is move this lever up and down. That's the bit they need to focus on. And you want to create a scenario in your business where it's similar. So, for instance, one, one thing we focus on with our clients is you have metrics on your dashboard that the goal of a salesperson, they sit down in the morning, they look at their dashboard, and they, their goal is to get the number to zero because this widget shows you how many calls you have to make and who you have to call. Well, your job today is to get that to zero. And nobody needs to explain this more than once. It's just, well, your job is you come in in the morning, you look at that, and you start calling, and you just update. And just having systems like that throughout the business so that the, the, the person then who's making those calls don't have to try and figure out who do they have to call? Do I have to call anyone? Do I have to call anyone today or can I leave it until tomorrow? And, and having those kinds of things in place just means your team, there's a lot of weight off them because they can just come in and do their thing. So, for instance, I'm with, with my my um, daughter is a massive Formula One fan, and I've got into it through her. And it's the kind of thing that when there's a pit stop, there's there's someone taking off the the wheel nuts. There's someone else taking off the tires. Someone putting a new tire on, and then the wheel nut goes back on. At no point does the driver get out of the car and say, "Oh, let me give you a hand with that." And, and everyone on that team knows this is my bit. And when the car pulls up, I do my bit. And that's the only way they can be as efficient as they are. And that, and that goes for, for businesses as well. Um, and pretty much at any scale that you want to create that scenario where someone can just up, can come in and fulfill their role without necessarily needing to create that role and determine the role every day when they turn up for work. And I know early on, one of the things I struggled with was I would have 15 minutes and I'd be like, well, what can I do? And I'd spend 15 minutes thinking about what I could do. And I finally created a system that when I had 15 minutes, I looked at my list and it said, do this. And I went, okay, I'm going to do that. Yeah. And stuff just started getting done like crazy. And my list got empty and it just made it so much simpler that I was focused on taking action versus trying to think. And I know in the world of sales, trying to get a person to make phone calls and and prospect and all of that, it's a lot easier when you say, call this person, do it now. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Anyone on this list, just call them this morning. Yeah. Okay. And and it's the same. We, we, we take it for granted, but it's the same when, when you're driving a car. Um, if you wanted to, drive a hundred yards, but you have to think about, okay, 
are the, where are the wheels pointing? Which piston's going to move first? Which one's going to move last? What's the position of the crankshaft? And, and all of that, you wouldn't make it off the driveway. But because all you've got is go faster or slower, <laughs> go forward or back, turn left or right, and look at the dashboard, you can drive a car. But a car is actually, especially nowadays, they're incredibly complex machines. But all you have to do is use the, the minimal tools to operate that machine. And, and that's really the way you want to, to look at setting up the systems in your business to achieve those same things, where you've got a few small levers to pull, but can have this impact. Interesting. One of the things I noticed you said in the book that, that kind of caught my eye is help cure their businesses from the cancer of two minute tasks. Yeah. Um, so the, the backstory to that is, and, and, and I do talk about it as being the cancer of two minute tasks is I, I have a slightly disproportionate understanding of cancer because my wife is a cancer doctor. So um, that's there, but it is that the, these, and, and two minutes is just um, an easy handle for it, but it's insidious and invisible in our businesses and everyone's business has it. And it's the kind of thing that, um, and Mike talks about it in clockwork actually as, as well. It's the kind of thing where you just constantly, oh, it'll only take two minutes. I'll do that. It'll only take two minutes. I'll do that. And these things pile up and, um, if you do the calculation for it um, and you say, okay, well, I can, through automation, all the right systems, I can automate or eliminate this task. And you think, well, okay, if I eliminate this task, I save two minutes. It's hardly worth the hassle. But then you start thinking, okay, but it's being done 10 times a day, 20 minutes. There's five people in my team who's doing it. That's 100 minutes being done five days a week <laughs> and, and it all adds up. And if you then get, you, you very quickly get to a point where you realize that you are very easily using up 104, if, if you're lucky enough to work eight hour days, 104 working days of the year doing these two minute tasks. And if you think, well, I don't have 10 people on my team, that's fine, but you've got multiples of these tasks. And you think, well, okay, through automation or the right systems, I can claw back 100 days of working capacity for my business. The impact that you can have on the business is enormous. But the reason why people don't take the action is because the loss of those 100 days happens in these two-minute chunks. And therefore, it's not noticed. But if you then add it up, you think, well, okay, what did it cost you to pay a team member that amount of money for, for those hours where you can claw that back. And it has the impact that you're then able to take those tasks away from the people on your team and they can then focus on delivering real value, both to the customers and to the business. So when I see that and I hear that, I know that if you can claw back those hours, it goes directly to the bottom line which means your profit increases at a multiple of what you would expect. Yeah. And so many businesses tend to run at the edge. They're, they're, they're tight to the money. They're tight to the time. And they don't spend the time to build out their systems and processes mm -hmm. and do this. And if they would just do that, they would get so much more out of the resources they have that literally without spending another penny – they could be profitable just by being focused. Yeah. And, and, and the key is there is being focused. So um, there's a really good um, book, and I forget the author's name, but it's Algorithms to Live By. Hmm. And one of the things they talk about is if you are focused on doing something, you're, you're half an hour into a focused task, if someone comes and interrupts you and asks you a question, it takes you 17 minutes to get back to the level of focus you were at before they interrupted you. Now, if you, if you think of that person, that interruption as one of these two minute tasks, you very quickly realize that it's not just the two minutes you lose. 
but it's the mistakes that are made in the following 17 minutes where you're trying to get back to your level of focus and 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 trying to do work that way and and that and that's why there's this disproportionate impact of having the systems in place on both the bottom line and just the the, the general running of the business and that makes total sense and a lot of this is hidden right mm. cuz that's not showing up anywhere it doesn't show up yeah. on a p&l doesn't show up on a balance sheet doesn't show up on most company dashboards or metrics yeah. at all you just wonder hey we've got all these people and everyone's running around with their hair on fire why isn't anything getting done yeah and that's the reason why you're all essentially tripping over each other yeah and 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 and, and also there's an element of um, and Michael Gerber talked about this in the day as well, where it's, let's say you've got 10 people on your team. If you don't have systems in place, it just means you've got 10 systems in your business because they all do it the way they think it's right rather than a consistent delivery of whatever it is that you're doing. So you, you, you have systems, whether you've created them or not, they're just a bit chaotic and ad hoc if they're not clearly defined. We say the same thing about culture. Your company has a culture, whether you defined yeah. it or not. Yeah. It seems all of these things come back to very simple principles. Yeah. And you've got to implement those simple principles and get it down. So tell us, that when what is it that you do for clients and how do you help them create systems? So um, the, the core of our business now is our software product, um, which allows you to um, create a custom CRM and all the automated processes that flow that you want out of that. And and Macanta really is a box of Lego. And it's then up to you. Well, do you build a square house with a flat roof or do you want to build Starship Enterprise? It's up to you. And you can change the system as your business needs change. You just amend it and add automations, add data items, whatever you want. Um, and what one of the things where Macanta is a bit different, apart from the fact that it's completely customizable, is CRMs tend to be contact-centric, um, both for just the data storage and for the automation. So there is a contact with a name and an email, email address and a few other bits of information, and it's that contact that drops into a campaign and goes through a process. The problem is for lots of businesses, it's not the contact that goes through the process. So if you take real estate as an example, when you sell a property, it's the property that goes through the process of being sold. My relationship to that process is that I'm the vendor and yours might be that you're the agent, but you're not going through the process and neither am I. So what Macanta allows you to do is create these data objects. So if you're real estate, it would be properties. If you're a law firm, it would be case files, whatever the scenario is. And then the contacts will have a relationship to it. So if we take the legal example, you can then have the client, the, the lawyer, the file handler, the admin, the accounts, whatever it is. But you can then see who are all the people involved in it. And then you can create automated processes based with the intelligence of those relationships. So if we go back to real estate, it's then a scenario of, well, okay, five people have viewed the property. Now one person places an offer on it. At that point, I can then automate, email the owner to say, hey, we've had an offer, give us a call so we can discuss it because I know who the owner is for this property. And the four people who also viewed it can get an email saying, hey, someone's made an offer. If you're really serious, you better get a move on. And, and those kinds of things, because it's with the intelligence of those relationships um, in it. Um, and then there's just combinations of how you can go about and do it. You can sign up and follow the videos and learn how to build it all yourself and you look after it. Or you can get us to do an initial configuration and where we get on a call and we discuss what it is you need and and we do that initial configuration. And then you've got the option also to then just carry on and, and give us a shout whenever you need a process changed or, or anything added to it. 
Um, is there a particular niche market that you focus on or? We're, we're loosely at the moment, we're, we're in a process of another round of pumpkin plan, but at the moment it's very much towards sort of legal accounting, um, insurance, uh, some real estate. And it's really, it's the kinds of businesses where it's, it actually matters that the process is followed. Okay. And, and, and the reason for us is simply because it, it makes our work easier to be transparent. It's easier to sell to those people because the process needing to follow is actually a really important part of their business. Um, whereas we do have other niches that we've got clients in. So electrical contracting is one example where the business runs a lot smoother when the process is followed, but it's less of a requirement mm. to a certain extent. Um, so I'd, I'd, I'd say the biggest thing is just whether it's either the industry or the business owner, that it actually matters that the process is followed. Because we do find that some people like the idea of having systems and processes, but they always want to allow for, well, Jeff doesn't really like doing it this way. It's like, well, either you have a system and Jeff falls in line or you don't have a system. But having a system that five people in the team does, but Jeff in the corner gets to do his own thing, it just it starts because then they want to change the system to allow for Jeff. And it just becomes very fragmented and just uh, doesn't work as well. I think it's time for Jeff to leave. <laughs> well, well that, that's, it's, it's one of my favorite Michael Gerber quotes is where he says, either the people change or the people change. <laughs> <laughs> it may, I, you, you have systems and processes and you just have to run them, you know, or change the system, but not for the one person change the no. system because the system had a problem and yeah. it wasn't serving <clears throat> you well. And this person said, Hey, the system's actually broken. Let's fix yeah. it. And I'm cool with and, that. And, and, and that's one of the key things that why we want Macanta to be as customizable as possible from the end user's perspective is because we're not pouring concrete. You, you put a system in place and you soon realize, well, actually, we missed this bit or this has now changed in our business. So we want to add a piece on. It's not a case of, well, that's the system and that's it. Um, because then the business can't evolve either and can't progress. But you have, you have to at least start with the basics in place. That makes total sense. Is there anything that we should have chatted about today but didn't get a chance to? No, I think, I think we covered quite a lot. Um, so no, I think that's good. If people would like to learn more about you and your company, what is the best way for them to do that? Um, so you can either just go to mccantacrm.com um, and book a call. Let's have a chat. Or you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm fairly easy to find, find there and just get in touch. And I'm more than happy to chat and help where I can. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll put that in the show notes for everyone. Great. Thanks for listening to today's episode. I'm Gita. I'm another one of the Profit First professionals on the team. In last week's episode, we talked about money as a valuable resource in your business. And today we've talked about how time is just as valuable for you as a business owner. Peter and Rocky specifically discussed how you can use systems to get some of your time back and to help cure your business from the cancer of two-minute tasks. Especially if you have recurring tasks, automating and systematizing these types of things will ultimately get you a lot of time back as a business owner to work on what you're good at and what you love. Following from that, this week's key takeaway and action challenge is thinking about how you can systematize your lead generation, sales, and customer fulfillment in your company. So this can include your social media, your website, or anywhere else that your uh, customers may be interacting. A couple examples of this could include customers being put into a funnel after they interact with your social media and then having their interactions lead them down a personalized path based on their interest. Uh, for your website, this could look like showing a different front page story based on uh, how they interacted with you and how they found you if you're directing them to your website from somewhere else.
You could also automate the onboard process and the post-sale follow-up. And even though this might seem like more work up front, the purpose of putting the system in place, again, is to get you more time back to do the things that only you as the business owner are capable of doing. It gives you more time to focus on what you're good at and what you love. If you want a done-for-you service, you can hire us as your chief profitability officers. You have your own area of expertise, and maybe you want to spend more of your time doing what you love. We only work with a handful of clients, so they all get our full attention. We work with business owners who have or are growing to half a million to five million in revenue. You can use the scheduling link in the show notes to get on our calendar for a good fit conversation to see if we're the right people to support you and how we can help you. Hey, it's Rocky. Don't forget to check out my other podcast, Richer Soul, where we talk about life beyond money and how to live that ultimate life and become a better leader in your company. As we close out, let's repeat the mantra. Revenue is vanity, profit is sanity, and cash is king. Have an abundant and profitable week.